Yeah, it's it's been. Uh, I think that's when when you really look at the the span of the course of the pandemic and how from the very beginning it was explicitly political because there were so many decisions being made on a federal and state level in the U.S. and across the world to do certain things. Like all of a sudden we were getting stimulus checks in the mail. Well, I thought we weren't able to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Or all of a sudden more people are on Medicaid. All of a sudden people can go to the hospital. If it's specifically about COVID, they can get uh, medical care. Certainly the hospital systems, the medical care system was completely overburdened and overwhelmed and could not <laughs> perform adequately under many of the, 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 that period of time very well. But still, it was obvious it was an incredibly politically, it was a political issue. Um, and then the, yeah, you, know, you described that perfectly because it's like over the course of these three plus years, it has been the process of depoliticizing the pandemic response. And then what happens is on a personal individual level, all of these things you've described in your essay um, that loneliness, it, it manifests in anger. Like I get so fucking angry so often yeah. in ways that I've never felt angry before. Certainly I had a sort of general anger around capitalism is awful and I'm seeing really awful things happening as a consequence of that, but in a very interpersonal level. Um, and again, I know I'm speaking as like a white guy, <laughs> so there is some level to that as well, but certainly for a lot of people where like, we're we're directing our anger at this depolitization of social murder onto other people, whether they choose to mask or not, because it's like a very visible example of taking care of one another. Um, it, it's hard to sort of suss out who should I be angry at, where should I direct my anger, my energy, right? Oh, completely. It, you know, and I'm not. I'm I, so. I eventually would really like to read more about. Um, like psych- about psychoanalytic theory and stuff like that. There's a mm-hmm. there's been some cool work done on that recently, kind of in the Marxism psychoanalysis overlap and stuff. I'd like to have a better grasp on just because it it feels new. It feels newly relevant to how fucking awful life is right now. Mm-hmm. But um, <laughs> you know, I think some of the time it's like in my own life anywhere. It's just like I'm just kind of like a bubbling with bad feelings, mm-hmm. and this is the this is the place that happened to allow that stuff to come out. Mm -hmm. And so it's not so much that I'm furious with this person. It's that I'm miserable. And this interaction is the place where that misery can come out. And so I'm like, I'm like kind of, I'm like, you know, whereas on a good day, be like, you know, I'd be low key pissed at you, but like, it's fine. And on a bad day, it's like, it's really not fine. And this sort of all needs to come out. I think that's one piece of it is like, we're all just sort of walking around carrying too much. And, 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 you know, living through the unbearable. Um, I also think that there's a way in which we're encouraged to misunderstand these processes and to place decision, place power where it isn't, you know, or like, so there's one account of the pandemic, which is like, hey, this is a bunch of individuals and it adds up to a pandemic. Mm -hmm. But that's not really true. Like this is, this is massive institutional failures from the top down and bad individual choices are occurring in that framework and partly as a result of that framework. So um, like there are people making poor individual choices, but they're doing so partly as an effect of now as an effect of those poor institutional designs. And then what happens is those individual choices become tiny feedback loops that reinforce the fucked up condition of institutional failure. Yeah. But, um, and, you know, and I think also there's one thing I find really hard myself, and I don't, I don't think I really got into this in the piece, but is, um, so I, I don't mean this flippantly, but this is how I think about it. There's the line from Spider-Man of like, with great power comes great responsibility, right? Like yeah. your degree mm-hmm. of capacity to act is the degree to which you can be reasonably held responsible for your actions. So like my kids are just kids, like they're not really responsible in the way that adults are. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and part of what's hard is in my opinion, it it is not reasonable to assume like that every individual person has the same set of capacities to respond to the pandemic in the way that they ought to. There's a kind of gradient of 
you know, both like material conditions in terms of ability to work from home and so on, but also like, you know, people, there are people who live in just totally poisoned information environments and are like not just are not, don't have access to the kind of critical ecosystem of information that you and I have access to, you know, like it's not, you know, it's not like the government is piping death panel into the homes of all 300 million Americans, right? Like, no, yeah. um, <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. and so there's not, you know, so like the, the people are not equipped in various ways. And and that's a, a hard thought because that is that's kind of a condescending thought to say someone's hey you're not fully equipped, right? Lets them off the hook for responsibility, but it also says hey I don't really think you're a peer, and so for yeah. me that's been a really unpleasant thing because I don't like thinking of people in that way, but it's been this kind of gradient of like either I downgrade people in the degree to which I think they're a peer, or I'm really frustrated by the degrees to which. My people. So the more someone is a peer, the more I'm like, why are you acting this way? Yeah. Um, and the the less someone is a peer, the less I'm frustrated about that. But the trade off is that I don't think of them as a peer. And there's kind of a, there's like no good position in that. Like every single option in that, like kind of hurts because like I don't yeah. like it feels condescending and also like it's a thing in a relationship. Like I can, you know, I have relatives who I love very much and i disagree with very much and it's like hey i'm just not going to get into that with you it's you know over the Mm -hmm. on this phone call and and like that's part of being in that relationship but it's also is sort of saying like hey you're not someone who i have free and frank dialogue with and that's part of like maintaining the relationship is saying hey you're not someone i have free and frank dialogue with whereas the more i'm you're my peers who i have free and frank dialogue with the more i am just kind of like why why are you doing this and Mm -hmm. um and so that's been for me is kind of, you know, I talked about this in the piece is like, and I hadn't thought of this until we're talking right now, actually. I think part of the loneliness comes in, in addition to what I said in the piece is that, is, is that my, my, my sense of who my peer group is just keeps shrinking mm-hmm. because it's, um, I'm either, and, and then in that group, I, I, the, the numbers of my peers who I'm angry with is growing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, psychically, it's, you know, I know, I know I'm not telling you, you don't know, it's really fucking hard. It's like this. Yeah. And that's part of why I wanted to write the piece is just to be like, in, instead of feeling this gut level misery all the time, I at least wanted to be able to have a map, you know, of what the misery was. Yeah, it helps a lot. I think um, for me, I've looked at it as sort of levels of trust have been broken. So like, there's this interesting categorization that starts happening where people that I trust on a emotional level of being close friends where I can have these really in-depth conversations. But when it comes to actual, if I really want to be in a physical space with them now, that level of trust can be either very present or not present at all. And that categorization of like trust that I may have or not have of certain people that I love is really, (laughs) it fucks me up. Like, you know, it's like, I can talk to you about my favorite music. I've been listening to this, you know, recently I can talk about my relationship issues or your, you know, your issues or whatever. We can have all these conversations. Then it really comes down to, I can't hang out with you in person. Our, our trust is not on that level anymore because I don't trust that you are coming into this space with me uh, where I can take off like very protective, um, a very protective respirator, um, and actually have a face to face kind of interaction with you. Um, that is heartbreaking. That is a deeply heartbreaking experience. And then you wonder what their perception of you is like, well, why are you so paranoid? Why are you this? Why are you that? Um, I hate it, you know, and this isn't, I- and, and I think, and I'm sorry, one, like, one thing I would also say is like, I've thought about this. I'm like, what is the end game of the pandemic? Let's just say tomorrow, all of a sudden, this virus and all of its huge soup of variants all of a sudden became benign. It was nothing. We get it and we don't feel anything. It doesn't do anything. All of a sudden, it's fine. We're still dealing with, obviously, the ramifications of all the people that have become disabled uh, and in compromise as a result of it. But the paranoia or the fear or the caution or whatever around it just can disappear. I think that the interpersonal aspects of how this pandemic has played out will always be there. I don't think I, I personally can ever just recover from knowing what kind of what has come out of my relationships um, and my relationships even to to more abstract things like 
institutions. Like I've always had a distrust of authority in a sense, but this new level of, of just like, these people will literally kill you. Like, of course they will, but it's just so explicit now. It's just like, Jesus, like, um, anyway, I'm sorry. It, it, I, I'm kind of, I don't know. I think there's some aspects of that are just kind of just <laughs> spewing some stuff out here, but it just brings all this up for me. No, yeah. don't be sorry. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm, it's, you know, I said at the beginning, it's, it's delight. I'm not delighted exactly, but it's, it's, it's an honor and I'm really, it's wonderful to get to talk with a fellow traveler about this stuff. And, um, yeah. I heard somebody say, you know, again, I think it's flippant because it helps you laugh rather than cry. But, you know, mm. like if this was a zombie movie, we're figuring out who would cover up a bite mark. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's yeah. real. And I think yeah. like, you know, I've, I've been in political situations, I've been in political situations where there was some stuff on the line, you know, like union, union drives and, you know, things you kind of, where there's some real stakes and, 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 and I've had people let, let me and other people down and I've done stuff where I've let people down. And, you know, and like a relationship can come back from that over the mm -hmm. long term sometimes, but it takes a lot of work. And I, mm -hmm. I try to hang on to that, that like, you know, hopefully this isn't forever, but I, I definitely at a gut level feel like what you've said of like, this sure feels like forever. And in those kind of, mm -hmm. it feels like betrayal in, in a lot of, in, in a lot of contexts and, and in the moment of betrayal, I think betrayal feels like it's something that never comes back. I'm hope I'm, I'm hope I'd like to believe I'm not hopeful. I'd, I'd like to believe that, that, that things can come back from that in the long term. But, you know, I, I do think there's, I think there's two things. I, I like the way sort of like, who can you trust? Mm -hmm. And I feel like from what you said, there's, who do you currently trust? And then there's also these violations of trust. And mm -hmm. I think those are slightly different because there's mm -hmm. like definitely people where it's like, hey, unless your values change, we're just not on the same page. And I thought we were. And like, that's really, that sucks. Mm -hmm. But it's like, okay, that's a static thing. Like now I know that and I can learn to live with that categorization. You know, like, like my mom has got long COVID and I just talked mm. to her yesterday and she spent, my mom works at works retail. She's, she's not doing well financially. Mm. Um, she's, Sorry. she's on track to hit six grand in out of pocket medical care mm. this, you know, this year. And it's only, it's only fucking mid March. Um, yeah. and, um, you know, and like, there's some real quality of life stuff. Like things are getting better for her. Like the prognosis is good long term for her healthcare currently is what it looks like. But it's, mm -hmm. you know, a hard, long process and a fucking expensive one with potentially really serious ramifications. Because if you run out of money, yeah, in yeah. addition to healthcare, there's other shit that can happen. Like at one mm -hmm. point, there was, a, you know, her house was going to potentially, she was in trouble with her mortgage for a man and whatnot, right? And so it's a thing of being like, hey, some people who I thought of as myself on the same page on, just clearly like that, all of the things I described for my mom and people like my mom, like is a lower priority for them than I thought it was. And like, that is like a, pretty mm. serious like we're not on the same page then there's another thing of like being like hey i'm in a relationship of trust still with you and yet you've done a thing that violates this trust or like hey i don't i ha i feel like we are still on the same page and yet we have that kind of broken this, there's these kind of betrayal and i think those are th those are all things that are going to last a long time you mm -hmm. know it, it, even even if as you said in a science fiction scenario tomorrow we wake up and all the virus is dead because it just is this thing of making clear, like, hey, the what I thought was the the playing field and the set of relationships. Either it's not what I thought it was, or it's changed really rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, I I am cautiously optimistic in the long run, mm -hmm. and you know, hopefully the long run is not too long. Like, hopefully it's in our lifetime, but I don't know. <laughs> in that, I think that I think that people's where people are at is not. I think where people where someone is at is like a is is a, a given that we can take for granted in the, in the immediate term. Like people think what they think right now, but I think what people think is malleable and, and can be changed um, mm -hmm. in the kind of medium to long term through organization and action. Like there's, you know, I think the progression of history is, you know, like if you think about the abolition of slavery at one point in time, enslaved people want slavery to end and almost no one else does. And then later slavery is considered fundamentally you know, significantly later slavery is considered fundamentally unacceptable as the dominant you mm -hmm. know, norm. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of examples in that in society where like movements for justice are laughable and wing nut. And then later mm -hmm. they're the dominant com common sense when they win and, um, after they've won. And they're usually won by slim majorities or, or large minorities. And so, um, and those, majorities and minorities get built out of 
from a condition of no one, basically no one thinks this. So I am optimistic in the long, long term that, you know, our kinds of values will win out the mm-hmm. sort of values of justice. You know, I, I consider myself a communist politically, mm-hmm. not, not in the Soviet union sense, but in the yeah, yeah. Marx and Marx and Engels sense. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I am optimistic that that will someday win out. I would like it to win out a lot faster. And in, yeah. the, in the short term, it's just, and in yeah. the medium term, because it certainly feels like this is going to be several more years mm-hmm. and it's been several intolerable years already. Yep. But, um, <laughs> and this is a thing I, I think I talk about in the piece of being like, that I'm, I'm, tr- I'm both really want to think about this and talk about it. And I also like keep shying away from thinking about it, talking about it because it's so painful of being like, this hurts so much. This has hurt so much feels like this is going to keep going and keep hurting for a long time. And, and that's really hard to bear. And um, yeah. it's been, I, I wrote the thing partly just to try to make sense about this stuff, as we were talking about earlier, just sort of feeling like a really strongly felt need because I was feeling so much distress. And I was, I was in regular conversations with, with friends, you know, who are coming at it like you and I are, who are similarly feeling the kinds of things we're talking about. And I was like, okay, it's not just me. I'm onto something at least, some of my close friends and I are feeling this and it was really hard to write personally. Um, but it felt better to put it out. And, and I am not at all, I don't think I'm a big deal in the slightest. I kind of, the idea of being, so like, I, I hate what I, I hate what I'm about to say. My book won two <laughs> pretty big awards and like, that's cool. I'm very grat- gratified, but like saying that to people feels like I'm being arrogant and feels like a big deal yeah. and like mm-hmm. kind of grosses me out. But I have, to my tremendous surprise, like a lot of people have read the piece and been like, wow, yeah, this really speaks to me. And that, you know, it's, I'm really sorry that so many people are feeling the same way, but it also is gratifying to know that there are a lot of us who mm-hmm. are in this condition and, and how we move from here forward. I don't know. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I recently released that interview with Rob Wallace, as I mentioned, and and something he mentioned is with the People CDC that there is a a pretty sizable, I mean, a really sizable portion of the population that wants that information, that wants to know yeah. what's going on as far as the pandemic goes, and that we're being really truly deprived of that information for very specific reasons, um, and uh, yeah. you know, and so so yes, I do think that. They're forcing, and this is what's so nefarious and insidious about depoliticization of social murder, of murder, is that um, it is a political act to depoliticize, yeah, right? Absolutely. <laughs> to say, this isn't really an issue anymore. We're kind of moving beyond it now. Let's kind of get back to whatever it was before the pandemic. It's like, but but no, that isn't the actual material reality we're all experiencing. So, um you know, yeah, there's absolutely a lot of people like us, I think, still um, that give a shit and uh, and want to want to yeah care for one another. I, I couldn't agree more. I just saw a poll just recently, a YouGov poll found that something like 47 percent of Americans have worn a mask in the last week. And there's real high approval for masking and for mask mandates still. Mm-hmm. So I, I this this was the thing in, a, in a, a, a early draft of this piece that I cut. um the uh, the um I worked with an editor named Chloe Reichel. She works at, at at Pest and she works at Bill of Health as well. Um, where I wrote some of the social murder stuff for her. And, um, she's really I like her a lot personally, but she's she's a really good editor and is really helpful to think with. And you know, part of why this is a good piece is from her 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 work on it with me. But um, uh, I had a bit in there that I cut that I'm still trying to think through. Is that I've often thought in terms of the, using the phrase manufacturing consent, which mm-hmm. I think is real. I think there is manufactured consent. But I think mm-hmm. another piece of what's going on is like a non-consensual prevention of politics. And so like a lot of people don't actually consent to what's going on. Like yeah. the reason the government has to prevent the information from coming out and the reason the government has to like lie about the the harms and why the government has to say like, oh, it's only, you know, people, it's only the disabled who don't matter. Mm-hmm. Right, guys? Like the right. reason they have to say all mm-hmm. that stuff is because they're not succeeding in manufacturing consent. Like, mm-hmm. like if if there was consent, the government could just publish the numbers and people be like, yeah, okay, well, that's unfortunate, but I'm okay with that risk calculation. And I think, in fact, there's a really large proportion of the population who are not where you and I might want them to be, but they're closer to where we want them to be than the government is comfortable with, which is why they mm-hmm. have to do all this stuff that's like 
what's, I don't know what, how to put it. So they're not so much, manu they're not only manufacturing consent among some parts of the population, they're preventing dissent among the people who fail to consent. I think mm. that's also part of what's going on. That's part of the depoliticization. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. and, and final thing I'll say, you know, I'm going on, but um, I also think mm. there's an element of like, I've talked about this in terms of propaganda and rhetoric and I've talked about it in terms of ideology, like as like ideological, ideological actions by the government. I also think that living this life sort of exudes like, like pollution, like exudes like ideological effects. Mm -hmm. And so like the sense that you and I have, of, you know, all just like the, how lonely we are and how angry we are and so on. I think, I feel like, and I don't know how to articulate that. I'm not there yet, but I, I think that would be a thing to be, I would be really interested in hearing it's sort of moving forward from this piece as a piece to think with like that, that there's an inertia, a momentum to the form of life that they've forced us into. And I think part of what's in question is, are we going to live in a way that works as a feedback loop that promotes the inertia toward the direction the government wants the pandemic to go? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to be kind of break the feedback loop and it's going to promote things moving in a different direction? And I think mm -hmm. some of the the loneliness and the sadness and the despair, like that's a natural human response and normal understandable response. But I feel like that also is some of the time ends up and like the, the impulse to just scream at a stranger who has no power. Yeah. Like, I feel like that's part of the ideological effects that are not rhetorical and the government hasn't deliberately generated it, but they have forced us into this condition of this shattered playing field that, some of the, I think I say in the piece, some of the time we can get into fights that are going to win battles, but they're not helping us win the war, so to speak. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I th and I think that's also an element of the, that they've forced us into this life and we have to kind of be really careful collectively to like, it, I think people should just vent when they need to. And people who need to yell at people need to yell at people. And I don't, don't judge the individual behavior, mm -hmm. but that's different from, from politically acting together. Like, so if I go off on a stranger because I needed to, that's one thing. But it's not clear that that's a, a meaningful political act in response to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's also a piece of this is that we're kind of set up to be looking the wrong direction in terms of how to respond politically. Um, and not that I know what the right direction is or how to do it, but I think like mm -hmm. that's part of the effort right now is try to think our way out of where we're in rather than think our way along the tracks of the condition the government's forced us to be in if that right. makes any sense yeah yeah i think um it is it is hard to predict these things it's hard to predict a lot of these sort of um what feel below the surface and i think uh, so many people are feeling and experiencing and those ex those kind of manifest in ways that we we can't always expect or predict right it's just gonna like bubble up and all in it's unfortunate what happens on these sort of individual kind of antagonistic conflicts right it's like that's not helpful usually but it can over time if we find each other and have a language to describe what's happening it can produce something that uh is a fair adequate and just response to a wholly unjust situation that we're all forced to survive through if the, the best that we possibly can this is true and this is you know mentioning social murder is really a, a integral part of how capital operates how it works on the society so you know hopefully hopefully <laughs> out of this frustration, anger, isolation, and so on that we're experiencing in a pandemic, that that can be also applied to broader uh, analysis and, and, and issues, right? That that becomes something that really coheres into an anti-capitalist um, sort of uh, form of organizing and, and, uh, and movement, right? Because it's like, this isn't just an isolated incident. This is an anomaly. This is This is very much a part of how this whole thing works. And especially at this sort of so-called late stage of capitalism, we're going to have pandemics. We're going to have mass death and disease. We're going to have all of these horrible things happening on a global level, um, just as they have on certain levels throughout the past 500 years or more. So maybe, hopefully, the pandemic, as I hoped it would have been from the very beginning, it would be a, a really important lesson, a horrible lesson, but a lesson nonetheless, something we can learn from, I hope. That's what I hope I, still. I, I, sorry to interrupt. No, you're good. I'm done. Yeah. I, I, I really like the way you put it a moment ago of we need to develop a language and find each other. And I feel mm -hmm. like 
I think that I, I think that's that's totally right. And I think that's that's the way to think of it is like we need to develop a language and find each other. And the that we develop the language partly as a resource with which to find each other. And finding each other is partly a process of developing a language. And then and those things sort of operate like as a back and forth. Like we find mm-hmm. each other and then we reflect and we we further hone and develop our language. And then we that helps us find each other further, you know, in intensively, like we deepen the relationships within our milieus that we're developing. And then we expand the milieus and bring more people in. And I, I think that's a really I like that way of saying it. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> just psychologically, I like that because that's mm-hmm. like something that's a little bit more under our control. But yeah. I also just think that's true objectively, that that's like part of the task is like mm-hmm. building an analysis and becoming more of a we and that the we r- refines the analysis and the analysis helps constitute the we. Um, yeah. And I think in addition to everything else we've talked about, we talked about this at the very beginning before we started a lot of people are radicalizing right now and they're radicalizing with the resources they have at hand and the government is prov- is like refusing to provide a common frame of reference. My wife and I were talking about this the other day. My mom said this to me. She's like, I didn't know when I got COVID that it was going to be this many thousands of dollars of like cost. Mm-hmm. Like that was just an mm-hmm. element of it that she wasn't, you know, I was like, well, I, yeah. I kind of did, unfortunately. But yeah. my mom was really careful. Like she didn't want, she'd had Lyme disease previously and was like, I mm-hmm. was masking, which had no option. Like she got it at work. It was despite mm-hmm. masking. But, um, but like, there's not a kind of common frame of reference for how to think about this that's provided. And so I think I talk about this in the piece, we end up in these parallel universes. And I think it's been disappointing seeing people I thought of as comrades and fellow travelers make wrong choices and and think of this badly. And it's also been hard because I think there's people who are like, what I would think of as like relatively new comrades, relatively new fellow travelers having to make sense of all this, um, and in in some past examples, there have been more collective efforts and to provide resources for folks on enduring that. Um, and I think right now, because of the various limitations of a lot of the left, there are fewer resources. And so there's been a kind of abandonment mm-hmm. by parts of the far left of people who are newly radicalizing in the face of all this and leave, leaving people to kind of make sense of this stuff with fragments of the thoughts they had prior to this experience prior to radicalizing which i think is also part of the what's so challenging right now in terms of the feeling of alone aloneness and part of what's so pressing to figure out together a common language and figure Mm -hmm. out a common we yeah 